2 Samuel 21, if you'd turn there, please. 2 Samuel 21, as we continue with the life of David. We'll begin reading here in a moment in verse 15 of 2 Samuel 21. And uh, when you've found 2 Samuel 21, if you'd stand with me, we'll read responsively. There's a few tricky names in there, but we'll get through it. I got to pre-read it. I know you didn't, so <laughs> it's all right. We'll make it. <laughs> Verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint together. And Ishbi Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushethite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. That was very good. Amen. Amen. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where El Hanan, the son of Jair, Oregim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. And when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. We'll stop there. And we'll pray. Now, Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your word. Lord, we come before thee as a needy people. Amen. Lord, we need to hear from heaven. Yes. Lord, uh, I know these folks don't want my ideas. They want your truth. And so I pray tonight you'd fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. Please lead and direct as I preach tonight. Guide my thoughts and my words. Please remove any distractions from this room and from our minds this evening. Lord, I know this is a busy time of year. But may we stop and look to Thee at this time. Please work in our hearts. I yield myself to Thee as best as I know how. Please bless the message, for we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 21, David, believe it or not, after all that we've seen in his life, is approaching the latter years of his life. When we first met David in Scripture, it was way back in 1 Samuel 16. As a matter of fact, uh, his name is first mentioned in 1 Samuel 16, 13. David was then, and way back then, there, was described as a young lad he was described as ruddy. He was described as having a beautiful countenance. And we know that he was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. And it was at that time, and I, and I mentioned it this morning in the message, after God's rejection of King Saul, God chose David. And Samuel the prophet came and anointed David to be Israel's second king, but first God-chosen king. It was then, it's my contention tonight, that David entered into the battlefield. Now there's no doubt he had battles before that. As a matter of fact, he mentioned them uh, many times, things that he had gone through as a shepherd in the field with the bear and the lion and those sorts of things. But understand something, the moment that Samuel poured that oil over his head and said, you are now Israel's king, man, he stepped out in the battlefield. Right. And what a battlefield it was. And now here it is, decades later in 2 Samuel 21. 
David has now passed into the latter years of his life. His earthly journey is now winding down. His earthly tabernacle will soon dissolve. As a matter of fact, in just uh, one chapter, if you'll flip over to chapter 23 and look at verse 1, we read, now these be the last words of David. Here it is already. You say, already, preacher, you've been preaching a long time on this. Maybe I have. But here we are near the end. These be the last words of David. Go another page to 1 Kings 1.1. 1, 1. Notice we read another two chapters later. Now King David was old and stricken in years. And then finally look at chapter 2 and verse 10 of 1 Kings. We read, so David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Imagine the earthly journey of this great hero of the faith will be over. His race will be run. He will go, as the Bible describes it, uh, the way of all the earth. We're all headed there, by the way, barring the rapture. Amen. Can I remind us tonight, though, that's not a bad thing. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, that's a good thing. Amen. Revelation 14, 13, we read, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Amen. Praise God for that. Uh, Psalm chapter 116 and verse 15, a familiar verse. Uh, Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Understand something. Our last day on earth will be the greatest day of our lives because uh, we're going to finally meet our Savior face to face. Oh, we've met him already. But we'll get to see him face to face as Fanny Crosby penned those words. David's going to meet his maker. But he's not there yet. He's still on his earthly journey here in 2 Samuel chapter 21. Now, if you were to ask me to summarize David's life, and this is a hard thing to do, and you may uh, have a different idea, but if we were to summarize David's life with just one word, one, I think the word I would choose would be the word warfare. Warfare. David's life, think about it, from the beginning, was a life of battles, warfare. And I believe as we think about David's life, and we look at this passage, that that's a picture of our life as well, the Christian life. It's a life of warfare. It's a life of battles. Amen. You know, in many ways, if... Uh, you and I are going to live for God. We're going to follow the same path David did. If you and I choose that day, we say, you know what? I'm not just going to be a nominal Christian. I'm not just going to be uh, somebody who says, yes, I'm saved. But I'm going to truly try to live my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to truly strive to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to serve him in the local church. I'm going to witness to the lost. I'm going to do my best to raise my family for God. I am going to be a true follower of Christ. Understand, if you strive to do that, then your life will not no doubt be filled with battles, right. warfare, struggles, fighting, conflict. I'm not talking about physical battles tonight. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. Amen. And so tonight I want to preach on this subject, the warring of a king. Amen. The warring of a king. On May 1st, 1859, Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached a sermon from the new Park, Park Street pulpit. That was before he came to the tabernacle. And he entitled that message, War, War, War. Fight the Lord's Battles. Amen. Can you see this great preacher of God there in uh, England raising up his hand as he did Shouting forth, war, 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 fight the Lord's battles. That's what he preached that evening. He went on to say, as a soldier of Christ, you are to fight for your master, not for yourself. Uh, you are not to carry on a private warfare for your own honor, but all your time and all your power is to be given to his defense and to his war. Amen. 
He went on to say, let us mingle in the fray. Let us have something to do. We cannot be neutral. We have never been. Christ's church cannot talk of peace. The Lord will have war, he said. And he took that from Exodus chapter 17 and verse 16. And by the way, we must do the same. I know it's been a year that's beaten us down, hasn't it? I know what it's been like. I've lived in it as well. We've been trying to navigate through this thing. One thing after another, after another, after another. But understand something. We must not give up the fight. Uh, we must keep going for our Lord, no matter what the circumstances are. Amen. And by the way, we're all his soldiers. The moment you got saved and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, understand what you did. You enlisted in the army. You see, I didn't sign anywhere. You didn't have to sign anywhere. It's automatic. Don't just think it's the preacher, the staff, or uh, those that are in full-time ministry. All of us are to be his soldiers, and we are to fight the fight, not just at the beginning, but all the way to the end. That's what David did. He was a man of war. And he never stopped fighting. Amen. Well, look at this passage tonight, going back to 2 Samuel chapter 21. And I want us to see four truths this evening as we consider the warring of a king. Notice, number one, the consistency of warfare. Perhaps I should have said the constancy. I notice verse 15, uh, the phrases in every one of these, uh, uh, these descriptions of what David is going through in his life. Verse 15, moreover, the Philistines, here it is, had yet war again with Israel. Look at verse 18, and it came to pass after this that there was uh, again a battle with the Philistines at Gad. Look at verse 19, the phrasing again. And there was again a battle. Look at verse 20, and there was yet a battle. Notice again, yet war again, again a battle, again a battle, again a battle. Battles were not something new to David. His life was filled with them. You know, David was even seen as a man of war. 2 Samuel 17, 8, Hushai said to Absalom, speaking of David, he said this, Thy father is a man of war. Even God himself said in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse thir uh, 3, But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war. By the way, that wasn't derogatory towards David. That just was David's lot in his life. He was to fight those battles for God. And oh yes, there may have been, like me and you, small pockets of peace during David's lifetime. But overall, if you think about it, it seemed like he was in a perpetual state of warfare the moment that oil was poured over his head. Do you remember the very next chapter after 1 Samuel chapter 16 in chapter 17? Who he faced? Goliath and the Philistines. There it is. Warfare. The very next chapter after that, 1 Samuel 18 and verse 5, we read, And Saul set him, David, over the men of war. There it is, David fighting again. 1 Samuel 19, 8, And there was war again, very next chapter. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter. 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1, not only did David fight battles without against enemies without, David also had enemies within. If you'll remember in 2 Samuel 3, 1, now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David's at war again, battle after battle after battle. Even in the song that David wrote, we'll look at this, Lord willing, at the end of the, end of the message, in chapter 22, if you'll glance at verse 35, we read that he, God, teacheth his, my hand to war. What was God trying to make out of David? A soldier. Amen. Somebody who understood the battle, somebody who was willing to fight, and by the way, that's what he wants out of me and you as well. You know, God didn't save us and leave us here on earth, excuse me for saying this, but to have fun. That's not what it's about. He didn't save us and leave us here on this earth uh, to spend our life uh, filling up our bucket list. 
or going on vacations or seeing the world uh, or how much seeing how much money uh, we can make or, or even to do what we want to do with our lives. Uh, that's not it at all. God left us here to war for him. Amen. That's why we're here. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Notice Paul, as he's patching the, passing the torch on to Timothy, he tells him to do something. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Uh, don't give up, don't stop, keep warring, keep battling, keep fighting the fight. Amen. And that's what we're to do as well. You see, as you and I choose to live for God, it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't catch us off guard that this is the Christian life. This is what it's about. It is fighting and going from one battle uh, to the next. Amen. You say, well, I didn't know I signed up for that. Well, we did. Hey, he's the one who saved us. He's Praise the one that the gave his life for us. Certainly he's worth our life, is he not? First Peter 4, 7 says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Uh, God is telling us here, don't think it's strange when a battle comes. Don't get confused and depressed and discouraged. Say, I can't believe it, another battle. Yeah, another battle. That's the Christian life. You see, this world is no friend of God. This world is hostile to Christ and to everything biblical. And don't think that they're going to stand up and applaud you and applaud me uh, for uh, what we believe or for taking a stand for truth. Uh, they're not going to like the message that we propagate. Uh, you see, living the Christian life means we have engaged in warfare and the battle is constant. We're consistently fighting. Oh, as the David's life is described here, we see again and again and another battle and another battle and another battle. Just here uh, in these eight uh, or so verses, uh, he talks about one after the other after the other, and that wasn't unusual to David, and it shouldn't be unusual to us either. Amen. The consistency of warfare. But then notice number two as you go back to our passage here. Notice the variety of warfare. It's kind of interesting. Our text speaks of four different wars or battles that took place at this time in David's life. So there's four different battles and there's four different people that are involved. Notice the first battle. You might want to mark it down somewhere. You may or may not if you write in your Bible. But the first battle is described in verses 15 through 17. The second battle is described in verse 18. Just one verse talks about another battle. The third battle is described in verse 19, and the fourth battle is described in verses 20 and 21. And notice as we read these, we're going to find, boy, they were different. They were both similar, yet they were both, they were all different. All of them were unique, yet all of them had some similarities as well. But we can say this, what a variety, just like our life as well. The battles are various, are they not? Uh, notice two things about these battles. Number one, they're from the same source. All four of these battles were against the same people. The same source. Who is it? The Philistines. Look at verse 15 again as I point this out. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war against again with Israel. Verse 18. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines. And then in verse 19, and there was again a battle in Gad with the Philistines. And then verse 20, and there was yet a battle in Gath. You know where Gath was? That was the Philistines. All of these battles were against the same primary group, the same primary enemy, and that was the Philistines. The Philistines. Do you know that all of our battles are really from the same source? as well. Right. You know, the primary enemy that you and I have to face is the devil. Amen. The devil. It is the devil that is behind this world system. You say, well, the world's our enemy and the flesh is our enemy. Absolutely, yes. 
But understand, the devil is perhaps, we could say, the enemy that's behind the world system. The enemy that is desirous to provoke the flesh. And we, we read in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, has a warring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You see, the source of all of our battles is the devil himself. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31? We read, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. It's the same with me and you. Imagine the pictures that we get in the Bible of the devil. He's as a roaring lion. He's walking about. He's like that lion that you see in the zoo. I don't know if you've ever been to the zoo and saw the lion display. We were there in Philadelphia one time. And let me tell you something. When, when it was time to feed and those lions were hungry, they'd pace back and forth and back and forth. And they're just looking and looking and looking and looking. That's what the devil does. He looks in your life and he looks in my life and he's trying to find a crack. He knows human nature well. He's dealt with humans for thousands of years and he knows uh, what tempts us and he knows how to get us. And he is our enemy. And the Lord Jesus says he desires to have us and to sift us as wheat. Because the devil hates God. The devil hates God's word. And the devil hates God's people. And as long as you and I are trying to live for God, he will be opposing everything that we're doing. Right. And our church as well. He's the source of our warfare. Oh, Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, uh, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't you see what's going on in our country? Don't you see what's going on in this world? You think that's just by chance? You think it's just, well, I don't just get on. It's the devil. The devil is working here. He's working this world over. He's in his last moments. I truly believe that. Amen. He's trying to do everything he can. To institute his system into this world. And by the way, he's doing a pretty good job of it. We don't have to fall for that. We have to keep fighting. Amen. Let's remember where the true battle is. So these four battles, uh, the variety of them, they were from the same source. Uh, but secondly, we also see about these, uh, the variety of them, is that they were all different situations. They were different. You know, the Bible describes in this passage the, the, the battles were all different. Look at the first one in verse 15 through 17. We read, Yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. It's interesting that this first battle that David faced, as it's described in verses 15 through 17, is in an unknown place. In other words, all the other ones, it tells you where this was, but not this one. I'm going to make a spiritual application with these battles, if you don't mind me doing that, taking a little liberty. But here David is told, it just says, he went down with his servants, he fought against the Philistines, and we read that this man, Ishbi Banab, the sons of the giant, was his enemy. He was a son of Goliath, we read, and the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. Notice he being girded with a new sword, thought to have to slay David. So here this first battle that David faces, it, it, it reminds me of things we face. It's in an unknown place and an unnamed place. We don't know where it is. And the, the guy that's after him is using a new sword. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of those unexpected battles that we face. You ever have one of those? Where something, your day is going just fine and boy, everything's just wonderful and you're marching along. You've read your Bible. You've prayed. You're going to work, man. And everything just seems like, man, this is going to be a wonderful day. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, somebody says something nasty or mean or ugly to you. Or some event happens that's unexpected in your life uh, and you're not ready for it. Or some person that, that you don't expect uh, does uh, something. Some sort of unexpected event or conflict happens in your life. I believe that that's what this battle is kind of telling us here. It is, again, those unexpected battles that we face. They come, don't they? And they come often. But then there's a second battle that David faces. Look at verse 18. Just one verse here. 
And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines. Notice at Gob. This time we read the name of the place. Then Sibachai the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. So this second battle, here's another picture of the battle. The first one is an unexpected place or an unnamed place with a new sword, something that David had never seen before. Uh, here this second ba battle is at a place called called Gob. That's an interesting place, isn't it? Gob. I think it's something I find on the bottom of my shoe sometimes. But anyway, that's what it is in the Bible. The word Gob means a pit. A pit. And the main foe in this battle at Gob, in this pit, was a man by the name of Saph. He's another son of Goliath. You know what his name means? It means to be filled to the brim. Boy, when I think of the application there, the spiritual application there, I think, whereas the first one reminds me of those unexpected battles that we face, I think that the second one reminds me of those battles when we are in a deep pit and we, and we feel like we are just filled to the brim and we can't take it anymore. Those are those prolonged battles that you and I have that just seem to go on and on and on and on and we feel like I can't take this anymore. I know you've never been there, but most of us have. Well, you feel like I can't bear this burden anymore. Lord, take it away. This is difficult. That is the pit where you're filled to the brim. Saf is the enemy at Gob. Then I see this third battle here we find in verse 19. Notice, and there was a, again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where El Hanan, the son of J.R. Urigim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, a staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So here's this third battle. Guess what? We're back in Gob again. And the main foe here was the brother of Goliath. When I think of, here we are, back in Gob again. I think of those battles that we seem to face again and again and again and again. Perhaps we could call those those repetitive battles or perhaps it could be those here we go again battles things that we think well I'm glad I got through that I'm glad that child is back where they ought to be I'm glad they're now obeying me and doing the right thing but here we go again back to Gob, back to the place that we've seen again and again and we get those battles in life don't we Things that it just seems like, man, I just got, went through this, and here we go again. We just dealt with this. Now we're dealing with it again. Again, it's those repetitive battles, those here we go again battles that you and I face again and again. Then there's this fourth battle, which is very interesting. Again, the first battle would be the unexpected battles that we, we, that we face. We're, we just were not ready for. The other one's those deep pit, prolonged, up to the brim battles. The third one is the repetitive battles. But here's a fourth battle. It's pretty interesting. Here it is in verse 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born of the giant. Can you imagine this guy? He was this, this guy that David faced here in Gath, or David and his men. He is also a son of Goliath. And notice how he, it's this big guy of great stature. Can you see this guy coming after you? I mean, Six, six fingers, you know, I mean, coming after and sit on each hand and six toes. That would have been kind of weird. You know what those battles remind me of? You ever have a battle where you think, does this happen to anybody else? I think the weirdest things happen to me. 
That's those kind of battles that you face. Just those scenes you're like, what in the world? Uh, this is not normal. Uh, this isn't to I mean, I don't hear anybody else going through this stuff, uh, but here I am going through it. My point is this. <laughs> the Christian life is filled with all kinds of battles. All sorts of battles. Battles in our families, battles in our marriages, battles uh, in the workplace, even battles with church members at times and in the church, battles with our children. And most of all, you know where the greatest battle is? Ourself. Amen. My greatest battle is having to deal with me. But the Apostle Paul understood this idea of the Christian life being all kinds of battles. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 7, 5. For, for, for when we were uh, come to, into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Paul's saying uh, there's battles everywhere. I mean, there's not only the battles i got to face out here in Macedonia, but also the battles that are going on in my, my heart as well. And I say this, uh, and I'm not trying to just, we're going to get better at the end. I'm going to hopefully encourage you. But this is a Christian life. It is. Amen. You know? It's not running around and frolicking around saying, saying, zippity-doo-dah, zippity a, life is wonderful, you know? It is wonderful, but it's filled with battles. It's filled with trials. It's filled with difficulties. And boy, there's all kinds of them. What a picture it is of David here as we think of these battles. So we see, number one, the consistency of warfare. It never ends. Number two, the variety of warfare. Yes, the same source, but different situations. Number three, how about this? The lethargy of warfare. You know, it's interesting because we read something about David in this passage that we have not read before. We never heard it mentioned of David throughout all of these decades of his life. And we find it here, if you will, in verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. Here it is. And David waxed faint. So much so that as we read on to the next verse, we'll read towards the end, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So here, we, in, in all of the account of David's life, we've never read this. Now we read, David's tired. And the, the, the son of the giant here sought, he, sought to, he almost died. He was so tired. You remember back in 2 Samuel 3, 1, that wasn't really that long ago. It is 2 Samuel. We read, now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger. David kept getting stronger in battle. But not anymore. Why? David's older. David didn't have the same physical strength he once had. He's not that young stripling, if you will, that stood in that valley of Elah against Goliath uh, and said, Is there not a cause? Now he's an old soldier of the Lord. And he's faint. And he's tired. And he's weak. You know that this is a byproduct of warfare? Weariness. Getting tired. Do you know that weariness is one of the main causes of casualties in the Christian life? People quit because they get tired. Not just tired physically. Tired of fighting. Tired of standing for the standards. Tired of standing for the right things. Tired, tired of, of standing up for what is right. You see, as the battles continue, understand it is a natural thing to get weary. And by the way, getting weary is not limited to the elderly. It's not. Uh, getting weary can happen to all of us. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 30. We're going to visit this in a little bit here. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. 
and the young man shall utterly fall. I'm not talking about phys a physical state here. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about a spiritual state here. And it is easy, very easy for all of us to get weary in fighting for doctrine and standing for what is right and, and fighting to keep the standards in our home and, and guarding what comes in and battling in our own lives to be consistent in attending church and giving and showing up for visitation and soul winning and visiting our bus route consistently and studying our Bibles for Sunday school or for a message and reading and praying every day. It's easy to get tired and warm fair. It's easy. It's easy to give up or let up. That's why the Lord tells us again and again, Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for, uh, uh, for as much as ye know that your labor's not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why does he say that? 2 Thessalonians 3, 13, But ye, brethren, be ye not weary in well-doing. Why does he say it again and again and again? Because it's easy to do it. Right. It's easy. Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. My point is this. Don't let the weariness of warfare cause you to quit. Right. We do what we do because we ought to do it. Not because we feel like doing it. Because we ought to do it. Amen. Because God wants us to do it. But understand, if you're here tonight and you're thinking, uh, preacher, I'm just battling the battles. I mean, I mean, I work a full-time job. I come to church. I teach a Sunday school lesson or I do junior church and I'm trying to raise the kids for God. And man, man, I'm tired. I understand that. I always say this, join the tired club. It's a fun club. Amen. Some of the greatest things were built by tired people. Right. Some of the greatest things were done by tired people. Some of the greatest ministries are, were, were blessed by God. By tired, because of tired people that kept going for God. Amen. David was tired. He almost died. He's getting to that place where he's weary. Which leads me to the last point we're done. Not only the consistency of warfare, the variety in warfare, the lethargy in warfare, but then notice the delivery in warfare. Here's the good part right here. Well, I thought it was all pretty good, but that's just, my, that's just my opinion. But anyway. Do you know in each of these battles that David faced, the miraculous happened. The Lord. David was weary. David was tired. David was fighting the Philistines. He almost died. And every time, the enemy was defeated. The every time. Amen. You say, oh, well, what did David do? It wasn't David. Amen. You say, oh, right, right, right. It was those other dudes. It was... Um, Abishai, the son of Zariah, you know, Joab's brother, he was the hero in verse 17. After all, he, he smote the Philistine and killed him. He took care of David. And, and then in verse 18, there was another guy who stepped in, uh, 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 Sibekai, the Hushathite. Uh, he was the hero there. Uh, he, he was the one that, that took care of that sons of the giant. He slew him there. And then in verse 19, there's another hero here, Elhanan, the son of Jerah again. Uh, he was the he was a deliverer there. And then in verse 21, uh, Jonathan the son of Shimea, uh, he was the star of the show. See, people helped David. That's why he got through it. No. Amen. Well, kind of. You say, what do you mean? God helped Praise David. God delivered David. Amen. You see, it, God used these men, yes, but understand something, God had his eye on David. God knew all about David. It was not David's time for him, to his life, to be over. God had more to do with David. And so what did God do? God protected him and God delivered him. Even though he was weary and almost dead. You say, uh, look at chapter 22. Right after this happens, we're going to talk about this later. David writes a psalm. He's so happy about what happened. 
He knew he was tired. He knew he was weary. He saw each of these men step in and take care of him. Did he go up and say, well, thank you, Abishai, for doing what you did. Thank you, Shibakai, for doing what you did. And Elhana and Jonathan, praise you. No, look what he says. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord, the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. David knew who it was. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior that saveth me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You see, it was God Amen. that sent help to this weary man. It was God that took care of this soldier. It was God that was David's shield. It was God that delivered David. And understand something. This is the whole crux of the message here. As long as you and I keep going for God, as long as you and I stay in the battle and keep fighting the fight by faith, our God will enable us all to finish the journey well. He will. You say, preacher, I'm tired. Me too. And guess what? We'll probably get more tired. Because life goes on. Amen. And the battles don't stop. But can I remind us tonight that our God, although we may be tired, He's not. The Lord. And He is still in the delivering business. Amen. And He is still our God that will enable us. And we can still claim the verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Praise you know, as life goes on and we get weary in the battle, you know what that really does for all of us? It causes us to lean upon the Lord even Amen. more. It causes us to realize how much we really need him. Right. You know, when we were, when we were, you know, we're like David, that stripling, you know, man, we, yeah, I got the strength. I, I, I got this thing, you know. Uh, and God removes all of that. And so we have to say, Lord, I can't do a thing without you. Amen. Lord, I need you. I can't do this. I need you. I'm in the battle. I want to keep going, but I'm tired. It's, it's weary. Uh, it's uh, wearisome. And I need you. And he will enable us to finish well. Praise the Lord. Turn over to Isaiah 40, and we're going to finish here. Isaiah chapter 40. Amen. Here's a passage you know. But in the context of what I was preaching tonight, I think it fits well. Isaiah 40 and verse 28. Listen to it closely. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. Amen. There is no searching of his understanding. Notice, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Amen. But they that wait upon the Lord, the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Amen. Tonight, I want to encourage all of us, no matter what battles we face, and they could get worse for all I know, don't give up. Let's not stop serving. Let's keep fighting the fight. Amen. Listen, this journey is going to be over sooner than we think, right. and we'll be in the presence of our Lord. And when we are, we will sure be glad that we didn't give up. The warring of a king. Amen. Will you engage tonight? Let's pray.